Hello and welcome back. Nick here to continue reading The Indian in the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks, uh, a book that was read to me, I think, back when I was in the second grade. It absolutely captured my imagination. I think it has a great, a lot of uh, uh, life lessons in it uh, as well. Great story. And you're on chapter seven with me, where we're going to read about uninvited brothers. So let's see what this is all about. <clears throat> Omri was not supposed to ride his bicycle on the road, but then he wasn't supposed to ride it on the pavement either. Not fast at any rate, so he was he compromised. He rode it slowly on the pavement as far as the corner, then bumped down off the curb and went like the wind. The hardware shop was still open. He bought the seed tray and the seeds and was just paying for them when he noticed something. Remember, if you were just joining us, he had uh, taken his father's seed tray and a number of other things for, for his Indian to, to work with. And uh, his father got mad about that and uh, Omri promised to go run over to the seed store to, to get replacement seed trays to make it right. Um, <clears throat> the hardware was st still open. He bought the seed tray and the seeds and was just paying for them when he noticed something. On the seed packet under the word marrow was written the words in brackets, squash. So one of the three sisters was Marrow. On impulse, he asked the shopkeeper, do you know what maize is? Maize, son? That's sweet corn, isn't it? Have you some seeds of that? Outside, standing by Omri's bike, was Patrick. Hi. Hi. I saw you going in. What did you get? Omri showed him. More presents for the Indian, Patrick asked sarcastically. Well, sort of. If... If what? If I can keep him long enough. Till they grow. Uh, till they grow. Patrick stared at him and Omri stared back. I've been to Yaps, said Patrick. I bought you something. Yeah? What? said Omri, hopefully. Slowly, Patrick took out his, his hand out of his pocket and held it in front of him and opened the fingers. In his palm lay a cowboy on a horse with a pistol in one hand pointing upward, or would have been upward if it had been lying on its side. Omri looked at it silently. Then he shook his head. I'm sorry. I don't want it. Why not? Now you can play a proper game with the Indian. They'd fight. Isn't that the whole idea? They might hurt each other. There was a pause, and then Patrick leaned forward and asked very slowly and loudly, How can they hurt each other? They're made of plastic. Listen, said Omri, and then he stopped. And then he started again. The Indian isn't plastic. He's real. Patrick heaved a deep, deep sigh <sighs> and put the cowboy back in his pocket. He'd been friends with Omri for years, ever since they started school. They knew each other very well. Just as Patrick knew when Omri was lying, he also knew when he wasn't. The only trouble was that this was a non-lie he couldn't believe. I want to see him, he said. Omri debated with himself. He somehow felt that if he didn't share a secret with Patrick, their friendship would be over. He didn't want that. And besides, the thrill of showing his Indian to someone else was something he could not do without for much longer. Okay, come on. Going home, they broke the law even more, riding on the road and with Patrick on the crossbar. They went around the back way by the alley in case anyone happened to be looking out a window. Omri said, he wants a fire. I suppose we can't make one indoors. You could, on a tin plate, like for indoor fireworks, said Patrick. Omri looked at him. Let's collect some twigs. Patrick picked up a twig without, about a foot long. Omri laughed. That's no good. They've got to be tiny twigs like this. And he picked some slivers off the privet hedge. Does he want a fire to cook on? He asked, asked Patrick slowly. Yes. Then there's no use. A fire made of wood would burn out in a couple seconds. Omri hadn't thought of that. What you need, said Patrick, is a little ball of tar. That burns for ages. And you could put the twigs on top to look like a real campfire. That's a brilliant idea. I know where they've been tarring a road, too, said Patrick. Apparently tar is what they used for the roads back then. You could light it up. Well, I guess asphalt, our own asphalt still has oil in it. I don't know. Come on, let's go. They're going to go get that tar. No. Why not? I don't believe in him yet. I want to see. All right, but first I have to give this stuff to my dad. There was a further delay when his father at first insisted on Omri filling the seed tray with compost and planting the seeds in it then and there. But when Omri gave him the corn seed as a present, he said, Well, thanks. 
Oh, all right. I can see you're bursting to get away. You can do the planting tomorrow, before school. Omri and Patrick rushed upstairs. At the top, Omri stopped cold. His bedroom door, which was always shut automatically, was wide open. And just inside, crouching side by side with their backs to him, were his brothers. Can you imagine walking up into your room and there's the two big guys in your family, you know, bigger, more powerful than you, you know, and they are in your room and they are looking down at something. Crazy, crazy. They were so absolutely still that Omri knew they were watching something. He couldn't bear it. They'd come into his room without his permission and they had seen his Indian. Now they could tell everybody. His secret, his precious secret, his alone to keep and share, was a secret no more. Something broke inside him, and he heard himself scream, Get out of my room! Get out of my room! Both boys spun around. Shut up! You'll frighten him, a deal, said a deal at once. Gillian came in to look for his rat, and he found it. And then he saw this absolutely fabulous little house you've made, and he called me in to look at it. Omri looked at the floor. The seed tray with the long with the long house, now f- nearly finished, had been moved into the center of the room. It was that they had been looking at. A quick glance around, glance all around, showed no sign of the Indian or horse, but Gillian's tame white rat was on his shoulder. There you go. There's the the boy with the rat. They're bent down looking at it. There they are. Now, actually, I don't know if they're bigger brothers. Maybe they're small, younger brothers. They look they don't look that much bigger. Anyways, um, Omri looked around, no sign of the Indian, but the rat on the shoulder. I can't get over it, a deal went on. How on earth did you do it without using any glue or anything? It's all done with tiny little threads and, and pegs. And look, Gillian, it's made of real twigs and bark. It's absolutely terrific, he said, with such awestruck admiration in his voice that Omri felt ashamed because he didn't make it, right? He's got this little man that did. He goes, I didn't, he began, but Patrick, who had been gaping at the longhouse in amazement, amazement, gave him a heavy nudge that nearly knocked him over. Yes, said Omri. Well, would you mind leaving now and take the rat? You're not to let him in here. This is, this is my room, you know. And this is my magnifying glass, you know, you know echoed Gillian but he was obviously too overcome with admiration to be angry with Omri for pinching it. He was using it now to examine the fine details of the building. I knew you were good at making things, he said, but this is uncanny. You must have fingers like a fairy to tie those witchy little knots. What's that? he asked suddenly. They all heard it, a faint, high whinny coming from under the bed. Omri was galvanized into action. At all costs, he must prevent their finding out now. He flung himself on his knees and pretended to grope under the bed. It's nothing, only that little clockwork dolphin I got in my Christmas stocking, he he burbled. I must have wound it up and suddenly started, and it suddenly started clicking. You know how they do. It's quite creepy sometimes when they suddenly start clicking. By this time, he'd leaped up again and was almost pushing the two older boys out of the room. Why are you in such a hurry to get rid of us? Asked Gillian suspiciously. Just go. You know you have to get out of my room when I ask you. He could hear the little horse whinnying again, and it didn't sound a bit like a dolphin. That sounds just like a pony, said Adil. Oh, beard, it's a pony. A tiny witchy pony under my bed, said Omri mockingly. At last they went, not without glancing back suspiciously several times. And Omri slammed the door, bolted it, and leaned against it with closed eyes. (sighs) Is it a pony? whispered Patrick. A gog? Omri nodded. Then he opened his eyes, laid down again, and peered under the bed. Give me the flashlight from the chest of drawers. Patrick gave it to him and lay beside him. They peered together as the beam probed the darkness. Crumbs, breathed Patrick reverently. It's true. The horse was standing. Seemingly alone, whinnying. When the light hit him, he stopped and turned his head. (laughs) Omri could see a pair of leggings behind him. It's all right, little bear. It's me, said Omri. Slowly, a crest of feathers, then a pair of eyes appeared over the top of the horse's back. Who others? he asked. 
My brothers, it's okay. They didn't see you. Little bear here coming. Take horse. Run. Hide. Good. Come on out and meet my friend, Patrick. Little bear jumped astride the horse and rode proudly out, wearing his new cloak and headdress. He glazed up imperiously at Patrick, who gazed back in wonder. Patrick seeing this for the first time, his mind's blown. Then he nodded to Patrick, who tried several times to say something. But his voice just came out as a squeak. Omri's friend? Little Bear's friend, said Little Bear magnanimously. Patrick swallowed. His eyes seemed in danger of popping right out of his head. Little Bear waited politely. But when Patrick didn't speak, he rode over to the seed tray. The brothers had brought it out from behind the crate. They'd been careful, but the ramp had got moved. Omri hurried to put it back, and Little Bear rode the horse up up it, dismounted, and tied it by its halter to the post he had driven into the compost. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then he went calmly on with his work with his longhouse. Patrick licked his lips, swallowed twice more, and croaked out, He's real. He's a real live Indian. I told you. How did it happen? Don't ask me. Something to do with this cupboard. Or maybe it's the key. It's very old. You lock plastic people inside, and they come alive. Patrick goggled at him. You mean it's not only him? You can do it with any toy? Only plastic ones. An incredulous grin spread over Patrick's face. Then what are we waiting for? Let's bring loads of them to life. Whole armies. Then he sprang towards the biscuit tins. Omri grabbed him. No, wait. It's not so simple. Patrick, his hands already full of soldiers, was making for the cupboard. Why not? Because they'd all... Don't you see? They'd be real. Real? What do you mean? Little Bear isn't a toy. He's a real man. He really lived. Maybe he's still... I don't know. He's in the middle of his life. Somewhere in America in 17-something or other. He's from the past. Omri struggled to explain as Patrick looked blank. I don't get it. Listen, Little Bear has told me about his life. He's fought in wars, scalped people, and grown stuff to eat. Like marrows and stuff. And he had a wife. She died. He doesn't know how he got here, but he thinks it's magic and he accepts magic. He believes in it. He thinks I'm some kind of spirit or something. What I mean, Omri persisted, as Patrick's eyes stayed, stayed, strayed longingly to the cupboard, is that if you put all those men in there, when they, come, when they came to life, they'd be real men with real lives of their own, from their own times and countries, talking their own language, languages. You couldn't just set them up and make them do what you wanted them to do. they do what they wanted to do. Or they might get terrified and run away. Or, well, I tried with an old Indian. Actually died of, of fright when he saw me. Look, look if you don't believe me. And Omri opened the cupboard. There lay the body of the old chief, now made of plastic, but still unmistakably dead. Not, and not dead the way some plastic soldiers are made to look dead, but the way real people look, crumpled up, empty. Patrick picked it up, turning it in his hand. He'd put the soldiers down by now. This isn't the one you bought at lunchtime? Yes. Crumbs. You see? Where's his headdress? Little Bear took it. He says he's the chief now. It's made him even more bossy and difficult than before. And Omri, using a word his mother often used when he was insisting on having his own way, Patrick put the dead Indian down hurriedly and wiped his head, his hand on the seat of his jeans. Maybe this isn't as much fun as I thought, Omri considered for a moment. No, he agreed soberly. It's not fun. They stared at Little Bear. He had finished the shell of the longhouse now. Taking off his headdress, he tucked it under his arm, stooped, and entered through the low doorway at one end. After a moment, he came out and looked up at Omri. Little Bear hungry. You get deer? Bear? Moose? No. He scowled. I say get. Why you not get? The shops are shut. 
Besides, added Omri, thinking he sounded rather feeble, especially in front of Patrick, I'm not sure I like the idea of having bears shambling about my room or having them killed. I'll give you meat and a fire and you can cook it, and that'll have to do. Little Bear looked baffled for a moment. Then he swiftly put on the headdress and drew himself up to his full height of almost three inches, three and a quarter with the feathers. He folded his arms and glared at Omri. Little Bear Chief now. Chief hunts. Kills own meat. Not take meat others kill. If not hunt, lose skill with bow. For today, you give meat. Tomorrow, go shop. Get bear. Plastic. Make real. I hunt. Not here, he added, looking up scornfully at the distant ceiling. Out. Under sky. Now, fire. Patrick, who had been crouching, stood up. He, too, seemed to be under Little Bear's spell. I'll run and get the tar, he said. No, wait a minute, said Omri. I've got another idea. He ran downstairs. Fortunately, the living room was empty. In the coal scuttle beside the open fireplace was a packet of fire lighters. He broke... I don't know what that is. Maybe matches or something? He broke a fairly large bit off one and wrapped it in a scrap of newspaper. Then he went to the kitchen. His mother was standing at the sink, peeling apples. Omri hesitated, then went to the refrigerator. Don't eat now, Omri. It's nearly supper time. Just a tiny bit, he said. There was a lovely chunk of raw meat on the plate. Omri sniffed his fingers, wiped them hard on a sweater to get the stink of the fire lighter off them, then took a big carving knife from the drawer and with an anxious glance at his mother's back, began sawing off a corner of meat. Luckily, it was steak and cut easily. Even so, he nearly had the whole plate off the shelf and onto the floor before he got his corner off. His mother swung around just as he closed the refrigerator door. A tiny bit of what? she asked. She often reacted late to things, he said. Nothing, he said, hiding a bit of raw meat in his hand. Mum, can I borrow a tin plate? I haven't gotten such a thing. Yes, you have. The one you bought. A deal. To, oh, the one you bought a deal to go camping. That's in a deals room somewhere. I haven't got it. A tiny bit of what? But Omri was already on his way upstairs. Odile was in his room. He would be. Doing his homework. What do you want? He asked the second Omri crept in. That plate. You know, your camping one. Oh, that, said Odile, speaking back to, to his French. Oh, going back to his French. Well, can I have it? Yeah, I suppose so. It's over there somewhere. Omri found it eventually in an old knapsack covered with disgusting bits of baked beans, dry and hard as cement. Gross. <laughs> uh, he hurried across to his own room. Whenever he'd been away from it for even a few minutes, he felt his heart beating in panic as he opened the door for fear of what he might find or not find. The burden of constant worry was beginning to wear on him. I can imagine. It would, it would for me too, wouldn't it for you? <clears throat> but, all, but all was as he had left it at uh, this time. Patrick was crouching near the seed tray. Little Bear was directing him to take the tops off several of the jars of poster paint, while he himself fashioned something almost too small to see. It's a paintbrush, whispered Patrick. He cut a bit off his own hair, and he's tying it to a tiny scrap of wood he found about the size of a big splinter. Pour a bit of paint onto the lid so he can reach to dip, said Omri. Meanwhile, he was scraping the dry beans off the plate with his nails. He took the fragrant, the, the fragment of fire lighter, I guess some sort of coal or, you know, something, uh, kindling type of thing, and the twigs out of his pocket and arranged them in the center of the plate. He washed the bit of meat in his bedside water glass. Ugh, that's ruined. He'd had a wonderful idea for a spit to cook it on. From a flat box in which his first erector set had once been neatly laid out but was now in chaos, he took a rod, ready uh, bent into a handle shape, and pushed it through the meat. Then, from, a, from small bits of the set, he quickly made a sort of stand for it to rest on, with the legs each side of the fire so that the meat hung over the middle of it. Let's light it now, said Patrick, who was getting very excited again. Little Bear, come and see your fire, said Omri. Little Bear looked up from his paints and then ran down the ramp, across the carpet, and vaulted onto the edge of the plate. Omri struck a match and lit the fire lighter, which glared up at once with which flared up at once with a bluish flame, engulfing the twigs and meat at once. The twigs gave, gave off a gratifying crackle while they lasted, but the fire lighter gave off a very ungratifying stench, which made Little Bear wrinkle up his nose. Stink, he cried. Spoil meat. 
No, it won't, Omri said. Turn the handle of the spit, little bear. Evidently, he wasn't much used to spits, but he soon got the hang of it. The chunk of steak turned and turned in the flame, and soon lost its raw, red look and began to go gray and then brown. The good, juicy smell of roasting beef began to compete with the spirit, uh, spirituous reek of the firelighter. Mmm, said Little Bear appreciatively, turning till the sweat ran off his face. Meat! He had thrown off his chief's cloak, and his chest shone red. Patrick couldn't take his eyes off him. Please, Omri, he whispered, couldn't I have one? Couldn't I choose just one, a soldier or anything I liked, and make him come to life in your cupboard? That is the end of chapter seven, and the next chapter eight is Cowboy. So I bet you know what that's going to be about. Should be exciting. Thanks for letting me read to you here. I hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you check out the book if you like it. Uh, buy it from the author. Really great book. All right. See you next time.